You got it. Okay, I would say this is the single most important lecture for the whole damn course. And it's the single most important effect in physics. And one way to state it is without resonance, which is the, what we're going to be studying, we're all dumb, deaf, and blind. In order for me to talk to you, I have to resonate acoustical cavity called my mouth, <laughs> and you have to resonate or have resonate the, the cochlea fibers that you hear with. And those are pretty high quality uh, oscillators. That's one of the things we want to learn about is what, what does it mean to have a high quality? And uh, also to uh, learn a little bit about how that quality has really gone up in just the last few months. And the person who started all this is Ken Evenson, who's uh, listed in the uh, front of the uh, textbook uh, Unit 4, but I put the uh, my sort of epithet for him. Uh, he died of uh, the uh, ALS, the Lou Gehrig disease that Stephen Hawking has, except he got it late in life from a trauma and a bicycle accident. Didn't know at the time that that was going to happen, but that's how uh, often ALS, ALS uh, starts. Anyway, he's a hero for uh, making it possible for us now to take the next step, which was to build a GPS system, and then just in the last few months that you know, step has gotten even steeper. So we're going to spend time just talking about the basics of resonance for a harmonic oscillator, and that means a lot of things. Uh, and this whole chapter will be devoted to um, looking at things that are right next to quantum mechanics. We'll be uh, studying the uh, quantum mechanics at first without knowing it. Now, um, one of the things also I want to make clear is the functions in there, though, the, uh, the uh, thing that comes out is the uh, Green's function of this harmonic oscillator. Uh, it's really an much uh, more complicated so the Lorentz green function, but the Lorentz function that you're used to uh, in most of the studies uh, is an approximation to the thing that we're going to be doing. That's the quantum propagator. This is the classical uh, um, propagator, if you want, uh, to give it a name. So, um, I should point out, uh, since I said we'd be blind without resonance, that that's a really high quality uh, oscillator there. Uh, the one that sits in the uh, rhodopsin molecules that are in the cone, I'm sorry, the, uh, yeah, the cone cells of, the, uh, of your eye. And um, that is a um, you know, good thing to know. Uh, 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 you know, just to get a feeling for uh, what it takes to uh, see something, for the incredible process that goes, first of all, to emit the light, that's a resonant process, and then the light has to excite some modes in the vacuum, if we're living in a vacuum, but it's uh, fortunately not uh, quite there, so we can breathe, but then the light comes to your eye and begins exciting and making a transition. Of, of a state of a rhodopsin molecule. All of that involves what we're going to be talking about today. Incredible process. So, um, let me uh, put Ken's uh, picture up in that because this computer uh, makes him look like a criminal, which he was not. It's just the opposite of, of that. Very brilliant and uh, very hardworking uh, person that grew up poor, very poor, uh, in Bozeman, Montana. And you can read the uh, wonderful things I've written about him uh, later. 
In any case, we're not doing anything really complicated mathematically here. Uh, we're just looking at a second order differential equation for a harmonic oscillator. But there is something that's, that's first here uh, in this uh, uh, slide. And that is, for almost the first time in this uh, course, we're putting in friction. Okay, this oscillator has a frictional damping force for its second term. So this is the F equal MA equation uh, for a uh, damped harmonic oscillator. The damping coefficient is related to a number called gamma. And we'll see why we put a little 2 on the coefficient. And of course, if you're writing an equation that was for a particular mass, well, that mass has been divided out of all these terms. So that when I actually apply an electric field here, I have that ratio E over M that we looked at uh, just uh, recently in our first introduction to electromagnetic uh, Lagrangians. But the uh, acceleration of the stimulus, and that due to this uh, force stimulus, this is the uh, entire force uh, stimulus right here, but having divided the mass, a mass out of it, uh, we have an acceleration equation. Uh, we can get the contravariant uh, view of uh, the oscillator when we do that. But without the stimulus, we're going to do that first. And uh, without the friction, you've already solved this equation many times. And that equation is just something going around on a circle in a phase space consisting of the position and the velocity uh, divided by the angular frequency. So this is uh, our good old a e to the minus i omega t phasor clock here with a real part that's a cosine and an imaginary part which is proportional to the velocity uh, having a sine uh, uh, dependence. So um, once again remind you that the phasor clocks do turn like the clocks on the wall. And that's because when you're at the top, you have a positive velocity. You have to go to the right. And that sets the head in this right away to what we engineers would call a negative rotation. But physicists always have the minus in the i to the omega t in every, everything that I have uh, seen. Uh, and often they don't know why. But you can see uh, why. It is a phase space uh, that we're looking at here. And that helps us get a, a feeling for what's going on in this incredible resonant process that we'll be uh, talking about. So uh, as we go through this uh, without a lot of the complications, that is, if I, first of all, just look at uh, an oscillator uh, up close. So I've zeroed out everything except this restoring force. Then we'll put back the damping, and then we'll put back the stimulus. So we don't have any stimulus uh, right now. The re restoring force is the only thing uh, working on this besides, <clears throat> well, besides nothing. That's uh, uh, all, all this is about. So uh, let's go ahead and um, get the stage set for the oscillator that we're going to be looking at uh, in, in detail as uh, resonant forces and damping forces uh, take over. Uh, right now, we'll deal with an uh, oscillator that has exactly one hertz. Okay. Heinrich Hertz is a famous guy. He helped to develop radio that you could actually listen to t talking on. Uh, Marconi is given more credit than he probably deserves, but Hertz was a, a, a physicist uh, born about the same time as another Heinrich named Heinrich Kaiser. They're about within a year or two of each other. And Kaiser's the guy that instead of doing inverse seconds, did inverse length. The Kaiser is an inverse centimeter. Any of you that work in chemistry and do infrared spectroscopy, it's measured in inverse centimeters. Number of wa waves per centimeter. Okay. Here we're talking about number of waves per second, and we're only asking for one wave uh, for every second. But let's make it easy here. So our, our um, uh, animations, and I'm just going to uh, start this thing right up here. 
and get it going, is one hertz. Now the thing is not running at one hertz. There's one second there. It's already crossed the axis twice. There's a third crossing. There's a fourth. That's two seconds. Okay, so we're talking about, uh, here's the phaser, tracking the actual position of it, but also keeping track of the velocity. So I have the real axis up here, and the imaginary axis divided by omega is, is toward me. So I've turned that usual real and imaginary thing on its side. And we'll do that for all the waves that we do uh, in this unit, as we'll be tracking amplitude. So this is a nice sine wave here because I started with initial velocity but no initial position. And it's five seconds here, six seconds here, seven, eight, it's just going to nine seconds. And then this whole graph um, goes off the scale after the tenth oscillation, which is here. We'll look at uh, uh, um, a longer time in, in just a minute. But um, there is the, the stage on which we're going to do all the stuff uh, today that uh, involves uh, pushing oscillators around. All right. Um, let's see if there's anything else I need to say about this. Um, these, of course, are old drawings. A lot of the drawings are old. We haven't gotten this particular program uh, quite at the point where uh, we can make uh, drawings like the one that's on the cover of Unit 4. Just did that one yesterday uh, using the uh, animation uh, programs and then adding some stuff. So we'll um, do that now. Um, let me uh, take us back here. Uh, actually, uh, I think I'll go forward on this one uh, right here and make sure uh, that we understand the next stage in this, and that is to put some friction in there. So putting a frictional damping force here uh, in the simplest linear uh, possibility is something that's first order in velocity. So there's a coefficient b, uh, which we're going to set equal to 2 gamma m. Now remember, we divided the m's out of this equation, so there's no m sitting here anymore. That means there's not one here either. And uh, the omega 0 squared also, uh, <coughs> the kz has uh, dropped that and left us just with the omega squared. So these are the variables that we'll, we'll work with, uh, gamma and the omega zero. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I think that uh, pretty well makes it. Now, here's the big trick. Rather than going and doing the usual thing that mathematicians do with differential equations, we know we've got a much better way to look at it using the phasers and complex numbers. So we're going right to that. And, uh, we're just going to set the z to some amplitude times e to the minus i omega t. We're going to figure out what the frequency of this thing does due to friction. And you'd think maybe it would slow it down a lot. Well, it's kind of true. It slows it down a little at first. The, the idea is to go ahead and take this differential equation with that substitution and turn it into an algebraic equation. So at this point, uh, we have an algebraic equation that has a nice quadratic solution that's going to give us a real and an imaginary part. And the real part here, um, that's going to be omega 0 squared minus gamma squared uh, when we get rid of the factor of 2 uh, that's in there. So the real part of this thing, and we can go plus or minus, which would you like to do? They're both kind of uh, the same physics. Uh, we're going to generally take the rule throughout this uh, a course that we work with real matter, not antimatter that has a negative frequency. We're going to work with positive frequency. So right away, we're just going to uh, uh, scratch that minus sign for a while. But we always will have a minus sign on this one. So that is uh, giving us a solution when you put it back into the uh, exponent of this uh, thing that we've chosen, uh, phasor uh, complex expression, uh, to simply be e to the minus gamma t. So sure enough, it, it's going to uh, attack, it's going to decay the amplitude of the oscillation 
But it's also going to change the frequency ever so slightly. And that's the real point of this. It really is very slight at first. And that we need to uh, uh, talk about. So uh, before we do that, uh, maybe what I should do is come back on this one here. And uh, I will let's see if I've got this uh, right here, simple harmonic. Um, I think I'd better play it safe here and let that one uh, be. Come back here and go ahead on this. We'll keep these two uh, projectors more or less in tracking with each other. And what I'm interested in on this one is actually seeing what the, um, what the uh, uh, friction uh, does. Well, there's the thing that's, you know, the static drawing in the uh, uh, textbook. But I'm going to go ahead here and I'll pick this one right here and then reset it. I think I have to reset it uh, to make it uh, work uh, for this particular um, example. And the example I'm going to take is when I set gamma equal to 0.2. That's a healthy damping uh, that, you, that uh, we'll see here. And uh, the way to get that is to come here and uh, right click on this thing and get the damping coefficient uh, moved up from zero. And you have to be really careful with this thing. Uh, it's really it's a sort of uh, ugh, if I if I'm, if I'm lucky there I can I can get a point too. I see you can see the problem with having uh, just a couple of pixels uh, there. So uh, I'll probably have to key it in right once again. We've got to change those variable uh, controls. Okay, so this isn't uh, uh, what you do. Anyway, uh, we're we're going to restart this thing. The same initial conditions. Uh, starting at uh, origin and being thrown upward. And uh, what you're seeing there uh, is the decay. Now the other thing we can do here, I think, is if I uh, put this on near the axis, I can change the uh, time thing, right? Uh, let me Your see wheel? if I can. Mouse wheel? And then uh, bring, uh, I've got to figure out how to rescale that. Your mouse wheel does the scale. This does the scale right there. Okay, I want to take this thing out to um, about uh, 16 or 17 uh, seconds and restart it uh, right here. Okay, because this is where I want you to get a feeling for uh, what the um, what the gamma does as far as the amplitude. But as far as the frequency, if you just do a binomial expansion here, uh, you discover that by making gamma equal to 0.2, and of course it's 0.2 squared, so that makes it a little smaller number, that's being subtracted but still, it changes you uh, in the uh, third place here. That's not very much. You end up with 6.28000 oh, 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 instead of 6.28. 3, 5, which is 2 pi uh, for our uh, uh, frequency of uh, one rotation. That's 2 pi per second. So we're talking about 6.283185 radians per second. And we've just taken off uh, something in the, in the third place. Well, that means, and you can see it happening, that as far as that graph is concerned, I'm within a pixel of the right place here at 10 seconds. You can't see that you've lost very much uh, on this scale of things, okay? This is very crude oscillator mechanics compared to what we do in our experiments now. But uh, it'll go all the way off of this graph and probably have to go down uh, next door here if the graph would go in the parking lot before you see a one pixel difference in crossing the axis, okay? So, by the time you've made the amplitude crunched out to um, 5%, that's the, the, the mark I'm going to take here, when you've lost uh, all but 5%, that's a 95% loss. If that happens to your bank account, you, you, you freak out, right? So that's the, that's the line that we're going to take. Uh, you're broke to 5% of what you had before, okay? And that's a, an easy number to remember uh, uh, to use 
in you just thinking about uh, this stuff. Um, easy to recall that 5% is very close to e to the minus 3. Okay, so if e to the minus 3 is 5%, well, that's what we're asking for. We're asking for that exponent there, minus gamma uh, t, to be 3. And we've only got 0.2 on the gamma, okay? So we got 3 over gamma, 3 over 0.2, that's 1 fifth, okay? 3 over a fifth is five, 3 times 5, 15 seconds, which is almost at the end of the graph that we just ran there, uh, we're down to by 5%. That's the 5% point. Uh, that's worth keeping in your mind because the exponentials appear everywhere and this is a good way uh, to sort of psych out how, how big something is uh, by uh, using that e to the minus 3 uh, is 0.05. That means e to the plus 3 is 20. Okay? So this is 1 20th instead of 1 10th. Uh, there's a better way to do it. If you're going to be doing a fancy kind of stuff that we're going to be talking about later, the much more precise 5%, it's a little less than 5%, but it's really easy to remember too. E to the minus pi is, and I've never seen anybody make a point of this, 0 0.04321. You just count backwards. Instead of being 05, it's 4321. <laughs> so that, that's, you know, and then you invert, and it's 15.7 and all that uh, seconds that we'd be talking about, just a little bit different from, from this one, but we're only trying to get, you know, one or two figure accuracy when we're playing with this. This one takes you to four. Okay? All right, and there's all kinds of geometry associated with that little thing there that's how I, I've noticed. Okay, so, um, what this is going to uh, boil down to, this, this um, 5% uh, ratio, that is when omega uh, t over 2 pi, and that's what we're doing here is we're going omega, omega gamma times t, this slightly retarded uh, thing, uh, that's very close to omega zero, so there isn't much, too much difference there, but it is, is omega gamma over 2 gamma. This is a, a, a very interesting um, uh, a number uh, to uh, uh, look at. the. Um, Let's see if I've got that right. Yeah. And then the time for the really precise one, pi over 0.2, okay. So not too different from what we're getting. A little bit more time, 15.7 instead of straight 15. Okay. So, uh, we're at the point now where we can begin to talk about what's going to happen when we force the oscillator. That is, uh, we're going to go ahead and put in some... Uh, force. It's a function of time. Now, obviously, these are oscillators, so we're going to start off with something that is um, an oscillating, that is harmonic oscillating, a uh, function of time. But anyway, uh, this A, we'll often call it just A sub S, the stimulus. This is the stimulating uh, force uh, to this oscillator that's going to resonate it. So this is where we now uh, address the problem of resonance uh, and how it works. And that uh, 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 factor that we uh, just talked about here, uh, this omega over 2 gamma is a key number uh, to look at, uh, as we'll uh, see. How many oscillations does it take you before you get to uh, bankruptcy, 5% bankruptcy? Uh, that, that's what we're really talking about uh, here. and. Uh, that's what we need to do. Now, we're going to solve this equation, okay? And there are lots of cases in your mathematical physics where you have some sort of, say, Laplacian plus some other things, and Helmholtz uh, differential equation is not too different from this, except there's more variables, independent variables. But anyways, you have a differential equation here, and uh, uh, t uh, the differential equation is applied to uh, the differential operator is applied to this uh, variable we're interested in finding the answer to. So, why not just do it that way? One over that operator. Okay? <laughs> well, as it says here, pretty crazy. 
but not so terribly crazy because if you have ways to find the inverse of that thing and that's really what we're after not so crazy certainly if I'm willing to just look at a stimulus that is also oscillating with some frequency in this case the stimulus frequency omega s so now we're going to have three variables that we'll be pretty much interested in for getting the response of this thing uh, the gamma, the, the frictional part, the omega zero, that's the natural frequency, and then the stimulus frequency, omega sub s. So those are the, those are the only uh, really important parameters uh, that uh, we need to uh, look at here. So basically what happens is that you just take the double derivative of this chosen thing, the single derivative of it, and multiply by two gamma, okay, and that brings down an i, and this brings down an i squared, which is minus 1. And then there's just uh, this guy, omega 0 squared, just sitting there as a number that doesn't have to be uh, to have anything done to it. Uh, basically, we'll move it over here in the first place. We'll take the, uh, this guy here uh, that comes uh, from the acceleration, put it in the second spot here. And then the first one, the guy in the middle here, the first, uh, or first order, a derivative that gives us a single omega s is sitting uh, waiting for us right here, a single i omega s times 2 gamma. Okay. That's called finding a Green's function. Okay? It's pretty easy to do here. Alright? It's a particularly funny Fourier component of a Green's function, but great. We'll take anything that will give us an answer. Okay. So this, this, is, this is what we're going to be looking at is a, uh, I guess the mathematician would call this a particular solution, whereas the solution that we just worked out that had uh, the funny omega gamma in it was called a homogeneous a solution. Now homogeneous means that there's nothing happening on the right hand side of the equation, it's just flatlined. That's homogeneous, right? That's kind of the, the reason for that name. In this case, we've got a nice oscillation on the uh, right-hand side of the equation, okay? And then we get to use this thing. So we've got to talk about this. This is really a beautiful function. It needs to be looked at really carefully. And the notation I'm giving is sort of engineer-like. Uh, omega zero is a subscript here to indicate that's the kind of equation we're solving. And then this is what we're putting uh, in its way, that is, what we're driving it with. <coughs> A better way to see is comes later in this chapter. Uh, using Dirac notation, you have these two things sitting as a matrix element of an operator that is the inverse of this operator, or the quasi-inverse. Now, <clears throat> here's um, and a pretty crazy kind of looks a little. This is an actual <laughs> photograph, not a photograph. It's one of those funny things they they fit around with silver. It's not the kind of Normally normally but this is George Green, the guy that came up with the stuff that you learn about in Green's functions. Okay? He lives from 1793 to May of 1841. Managed to, this is the only photo or you know image I can really trust. You look at all the other pictures they have of him and they all look like different people, but this is him. And this is his memorial in uh, Westminster Chapel. He's British. And they thought a lot enough of him to stick a stone in there, just like they do in Hollywood for all of the uh, actors, right? In the sidewalk, right? Well, this is in the in the chancery of the uh, thing. Anyway, Green's Green's responsible for this thing. This is Green's function here, but it's Lorenz Green's function. It's, it's, Lorenz did this too, and uh, uh, he's just a little bit younger, so this guy gets his name. Anyway, what we're going to think about this is we apply a stimulus, there's this thing right here called the Lorenz function, which multiplies the stimulus and gives me the response. That's, how could it be simpler? Okay, so here is the thing that we're going to be multiplying. It's written this way, but it's also good to write uh, real and imaginary parts. Okay, so how do you do that? And by the way, here's a picture I just found of uh, Heinrich Lorenz. I'm exactly 90 years older than he is. And it's my birthday right here. 43 was my year. He's, he's 53. Okay. Kind of 
you know, a way for me to remember his birthday, right? <laughs> um, with, as I uh, get along in my age, it's harder and harder to remember those kind of little things. Okay, here's what you do. You got one over a x minus i y. There's the x, there's the y. Clear that. Get rid of the complex stuff in the denominator by multiplying by the denominator star. That is the complex conjugate, right? And, uh, make it one, so it's equal to that. And that's what we're after. We're after uh, x and y. This, uh, this is going to be, uh, this thing here is going to be the x divided by the sum of the squares. And this one's going to be the y divided by the sum of the squares. So this, you know, all uh, stuff that you uh, learn hopes, hopefully in high school. But here's what it looks like. This is a real imaginary. This is a Cartesian form. This is more like the polar, well, it's going to be the polar form after we get done here. Okay. So you need all of these different forms uh, to, uh, to work this. In order to do the polar form, you have to find out what this angle rho is uh, right here. And then the magnitude, you see, uh, also has to be uh, stated. So the magnitude, pretty easy to work that out. This squared plus this squared, I get rid of the numerator. I just end up with a square root of the sum of the real and imaginary parts. So th those are the numbers we're going to play with. We're going to see, you know, what what's involved in uh, getting uh, easy to remember mnemonics for what happens as we go through oscillators that are incredibly uh, uh, perfect. Um, now, how many of you uh, had a chance to go to the Embry talk, which occurred um, last Friday, uh, just out of, uh, oh, you terrible people. <laughs> <laughs> now, you missed an amazing talk, because this is, you know, it's really perfect for this. This is Jun Yi from Jilla, Joint Institute of Laboratory Astrophysics. That's, joint stands for uh, being connected between the Colorado University, CU, Colorado University, and National uh, Institute of Standards and Technology, which was, used to be called National Bureau of Standards. Okay, so that's our, our clock, clock keepers, okay, our timekeeper. Okay? And Jen Yi has found a way to keep time so precisely that if you ran his clock for the age of the universe, say 14 billion years, would only be off by a sixth of a second. That's how much we have improved our clocks. And that is going to change the world eventually. I mean, it is unbelievable. We already changed the world by getting uh, one part in 10 to the 16. We, we changed it a lot with Ken Evenson, just getting it one part in 10 to the 10 or 11. But now we're at 19. This is amazing. I mean, the, the ability to do this is really incredible. Anyway, the sermon is over. Let's get the basic ideas here. Basic ideas are that uh, this stimulus is going to be going around as a phaser on this uh, left-hand side of our animation. And the um, response is this going to be a constant vector relative to the stimulus? That is, it will be attached to the stimulus lagging by an angle that is this angle right here. That's called the phase lag angle. You see it marked uh, on either side of a picture that shows up on the cover of this unit. So th this is where we get to see the geometry associated with Mr. Lorenz and Mr. Green's uh, uh, function for an oscillator. So um, that's the thing uh, that we need to uh, get used to. So this angle right here is going to be that one as this thing rotates clockwise, uh, just like every other oscillator that we're going to, to diagram. So there'll be an imaginary part and a real part, but it's going to be riding on the stimulus. And the idea is to get the physics of that uh, straight. Now, this particular oscillator that we've just uh, taken here with gamma equal to 0.2 and 1 hertz uh, for the frequency, uh, this uh, makes a pretty good logarithmic spiral. But as you crank up the damping, that deteriorates fairly quickly. 
But for our purposes right now, that's a pretty good way to think about uh, that uh, uh, a spiral as the thing loses its uh, um, amplitude uh, down to, uh, say, 5%, which is pretty much in this neighborhood right here where it's all crowded and essentially solid. And I've been leaving this thing running, so it's still oscillating, right? It <laughs> Not <out>. by much. <laughs> We timed it out at 150 Oh, seconds. It, I guess that's right. This thing automatically quits at uh, a certain point. Um, you wouldn't have known it, though. There's nothing going here that would show that uh, for the thing. Okay, so um, let's uh, go ahead and take a look at uh, a couple of things that are important enough. This is a good drawing that I just finished. I'm finally starting to go through the, the textbook now and make use of the modern graphics. And th it's a heck of a function that we're talking about here. This is one way to look at it that's really uh, useful. But let's just start with a plot of first the real part, then in green the imaginary part, and then in this sort of yellowish orange uh, the magnitude of the thing, the modulus, if you will, of the complex number that represents the Green's function. Okay. I've used the color green for this imaginary part, which starts out essentially zero and then very slowly as we get close to resonance arises and then it just takes off, showing, shoom, all the way up to there. Okay. And it gets to there exactly at one, uh, in this case, half a hertz. This is a half a hertz, uh, a picture that I could. I tried to do the one hertz, but it, it, there was no uh, way I could use the uh, computer to get things just in the right place. So uh, we need to make that uh, so we can do anything. Um, but in any case, uh, the, so the imaginary part peaks out and then drops just as precipitously. In fact, more so. This thing is a little lopsided. But you wouldn't, if you were fooling with a kind of Lorentz uh, function that you're used to, the quantum one, uh, you wouldn't notice that this is different from uh, the quantum one. We'll explain that uh, later on. But anyway, at the halfway point, it meets the real part. The real part uh, sort of follows uh, the uh, <coughs> magnitude of the <coughs> argument, but then starts to say, hey, I don't think I can get up there. This is too hard. I can't make it. I can't. I'm going to have to stop here. So the real part stops here, essentially very close to a half of this. And then it just goes kaboom down to here in just this tiny little distance here. And then it's like, oh gosh, I didn't mean to do that. Turns the corner and, 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 and comes back. But you see, it comes back and gets close to zero. It doesn't stop like this uh, guy here did, this real part, uh, is very important. This is called the DC response uh, value, and that's very important in our, our figuring out our parameters for what goes on with a classical oscillator. Uh, so, uh, I just wanted you to see that much of it. And then, while all of this is happening, this thing is doing something as well. It's starting out with the real part. This is the real part versus the imaginary part of the response function, the Green's function. Okay, and it starts right here. You don't see that if, if you don't actually draw. I drew this in by hand. Okay, just to show you where it really was. The, the real plus the imaginary part um, fills this uh, phaser plane. Okay, and that's really important for understanding uh, what is is going on in a resonant process. But um, uh, Notice that uh, when it hits here, it's almost at 45 degrees. This is very close to 45 degrees, but not exactly. It's the quantum uh, Green's function that is exact, and we'll get to that one later on. It's, these classical ones are a little messy, okay? And this thing doesn't quite go down as far as this one went up. Okay, you see it's just a little bit shy 0.5. This one's a little uh, above uh, 0.5. So, this is not balanced, these two, right here. In the quantum one, they are, okay? But uh, 
this is the one we're working with. This is the one we're stuck with if we're going to do classical oscillators. Okay? And by that time, over here, you see that if this would have been plotted, it would have been a little lower. But it's on the negative side. So this is our resonant region. And so all within this uh, region right here, uh, this thing is going uh, from high to low and then getting ready to come back. So all of that is between here and here. And then it will uh, settle in as it uh, goes uh, along this curve here for the real part and along this curve here, the green part, for the imaginary part. So this is some geometry that you want to know some more about if you want to get good at uh, resonating. Okay, is this clear so, so far what uh, we have here? It's very important we get our, uh, our, our footing, as it were, uh, for this. So this circle, which would be a perfect circle for uh, a quantum guy, has a flat tire. It's got a flat there. And you can see this is very flat in this region. As you try low frequency stimulation, it's not very different from what you get if you just push on the thing with no frequency at all. Pick a given amplitude, push on it, and just hold it. It'll be the same as if you push on it very slowly with that amplitude up here. Push it a little faster, you're here. Push it a lot faster, you're here. Still not much difference, you see. It's not until you get into the resonant region that things take off. Now the other thing I want you to be aware of is that this quality factor that determines what's the ratio of this to this, that's 15. That's the, the number of uh, oscillations it takes to get to a bankruptcy of 95% uh, loss, 5% left. Okay, So those numbers tie together and we, we need to do the, that uh, going. And this is what's called the resonance, this resonant region, plus or minus the value of gamma, which is 0 0.2 for uh, our, this one has a gamma of 0.155. I just picked that out so that it would fit in the graph. Uh, but it, it's, you know, just it's less by than the one that we're going to be using on all of the other drawings that we do here. Okay, so let me uh, bring this guy uh, back to um, the lecture, go forward so we balance things out here. Here's this quality factor which we're going to be talking about, uh, omega uh, over 2 gamma, and that's either omega 0 or omega gamma. There's not much difference in those two uh, for the kinds of uh, oscillators that we're talking about. So, uh, here's the Green's function being derived, and uh, uh, diagram by geometry. Now we've got to look at the old stuff. Okay, uh, so um, perhaps I will uh, put on that graph over there the new guy. Um, let's see if I can back up here just a little bit. And here's the the old pixelated uh, Macintosh uh, programs that we uh, started out uh, years and years ago. Uh, with this. Now, in this case, I, I, I really am talking about a, a, a gamma of 0.2. Uh, so this one <coughs> has, also it has the thing, this crushed up a little bit, so this resonant region uh, doesn't show so well. Uh, it's much clearer uh, on that one. But uh, for th this one with a 0.2, um, it, uh, uh, let's see if there's anything I can say that's, that's different. They, the uh, lopsided, I mean, this, this is just a cruder graph, so it doesn't really show uh, some of the fine stuff. But the, the, the uh, quasi-circle here, you can see it's flat tire right there, uh, making uh, the resonant region. So this, um, the, the row angle, as we, uh, tu as we tune our frequency of the stimulus, our row is going to stay pretty close to zero, but then it's starting to start lag more and more and more, okay, until it's actually lagging 45 degrees, which is about right there. And then we keep uh, rising the frequency. Now just going from here to there, we're going to go boom, all the way up to the top here, which will be the resonant point. That will be when you get your maximum amplitude, okay? And what we need to show is that the resonant response 
over the DC response, here's the Green's function at zero, here's the Green's function when you set omega s equal to omega zero, and you can see unless there's a gamma, that's going to make this go to infinity, well it's going to make it go very close to infinity when we talk about really high quality oscillators. So um, what, what you're seeing here is the real part, that's the thing that's done in uh, blue, just like it is on that uh, graph there. And then here's the uh, imaginary part. That's the thing that's being done in green uh, here, sort of a darker green than the one over there. So these are the two parts, real and imaginary. But we're also interested in the polar form. What's the phase angle doing? And this is the thing that determines that, the arc tangent. Um, A tan 2 of this y over that x. If you're putting this in a computer program, remember to use a tan 2 uh, instead of just arc tangent so you know what quadrant you're in. And it's really important what quadrant you're in here. Okay, so it's this ratio of these two. The resonant response, which is this great big thing right here, to the DC response, which is this flat region that we have, uh, you know, at the beginning of any oscillator. Now, just imagine... Um, this thing being plotted on a scale would be reasonable for atomic physics, um, we would have this flat region go all the way down to Fort Smith, and then as we cross the freeway and get over to the other side, we're going to go through the resonance region. Okay, that, that's the kind of scale we're talking about just for simple atomic, not atomic, uh, en enhanced by all the modern technology, just a raw atom uh, uh, for, uh, doing its resonance. Okay, a naked resonance. Okay, it's still that uh, precise. So when they say spectral line, they mean line. <laughs> Just whoa, uh, right there at the center of the freeway down at Fort Smith. <laughs> okay, so uh, that's where this is headed. You see, as we make use of the uh, resonance for our technology. Anyway, see what you're getting here: omega zero over two gamma. Now, I, uh, this, this is related to what's called the quality factor, the Q, usually written as capital Q, upper, uppercase Q. This is much more useful. Take the two pi off and do the angular uh, quality factor, omega zero over two gamma instead of nu zero over two gamma. This one is, makes more sense because omega zero and two gamma are sitting next to each other in the exponent. Okay, so. Uh, this, this is the one that tells you that you're going to get an ampli amplification by doing resonance that's equal to the 95% uh, lifetime. The so 95% lifetime, of course, is the uh, one that we were talking about when we uh, let the thing oscillate uh, back to uh, the... Uh, see, well, let's just go back real quick and make sure you see this. Um, this distance right here okay the 15 seconds okay there's your 95 percent lifetime that 15 is the ratio of these uh, uh, two uh, Green's function uh, parts oops I'm getting ahead of myself here a little bit because um, I pushed the wrong uh, button but um, let me take this one ahead uh, to that. Okay, so that, that's what we're uh, dealing with that's really uh, an interesting number. The angular quality factor uh, is, a, is a key thing here. Now, um, this will show you some plots of these. They're going to show you the response versus DC response, the ratio that's so key to uh, all of this stuff. Now, um, just to see what happens if I go from gamma equal point to, which is what we were, uh, this is blown up a little bit. There's a resonance region. You can see the thing turning around and going down to about there, and then it would be coming back to, but we don't show that. There's the magnitude of it, that dark, dark set of dots right there. Then I just kick that in half. Bang! I'm up by twice as far, you see. And this becomes half as big. So we're, you know, eventually going to get an uncertainty relation out of this, uh, these ratios uh, here. So <clears throat> what you're doing here when you uh, make the amplitude uh, ratio 30, okay, 
uh, times your, your DC response, okay? 30 times after this, this is, a, you know, like a, 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 a skyscraper in Dubai, right? And it's really high guys, they're up around 2,000 feet, right? Almost twice the height of the Empire State Building, okay? And they, they're kind of slender. <laughs> they have to be, I mean, we're talking gravity here, right? So, um, that's what we're talking about is a, is a 30. This is a quality factor of 30. That's a really nice oscillator. It goes 30 times before it, it sort of peters out at 95% down, right? Okay, that's a pretty good oscillator. How good do you think a typical naked atom is? What sort of quality factor uh, goes there? Just offhand, do you have a... Anybody have thought about this? Because these are the kind of things you want to think about. Because they're, they're behind everything that the quantum mechanics and classical does when it comes to resonance. Well, the answer is between 50 and 100,000. I mean, you're getting close to a million quality factor. 100,000. Instead of 30, this is goes to 100,000. And it gets skinny, so skinny it's, it's one pixel, it's less than a pixel. Yeah? A question about the quality factor. So what exactly is it and what does it tell? I think I didn't get that. So at this point in our discussion, it tells two things. Mm -hmm. Okay? Omega is zero over two gamma. And let's take it back to the original so you can answer your question uh, more quickly. I'll, I'll go back again on this a part of the thing, which is just the timing, okay? It came up right about here, okay? And if you wanted to play games, you could make it more precise, but let's just deal with this one, right? The, o the o o omega uh, zero over, uh, let's see if I've got that uh, right here. Yeah, this thing right here, the, <clears throat> um, let's see if I've got uh, that. Instead of using, uh, Pi, I use three. This is a, um, let's see if I got da, 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 um, over three to over two gamma. The, um, this, is, the, this is the time for uh, five percent. What we're asking is how many oscillations do I get uh, to that point? That's, that's really the number omega zero over. Uh, two gamma that uh, uh, this is uh, uh, telling. I call it just the lifetime, the heartbeat lifetime. Take any oscillator and take its natural frequency, its heart rate, and then divide by two gamma and you get the number of oscillations. That's what this is right here. Okay, omega gamma times the time to five percent divided by uh, 2 pi. So basically what we do is it, 3 omega gamma divided by 2 pi times gamma, okay? And 3 and pi are close enough, so I have a little wavy sign here, omega gamma over 2 pi. So that's the number, in this case, 15, or if you use the fancy one, it's 15.7, uh, that is number of heartbeats. Does that make sense? Okay. And then that number is also the ratio, the amplification factor. The ratio of what you get if you really get to the, the, the special point of the oscillator's frequency, you get that much amplification compared to what you would have if you just pushed on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So it's a really key number. It's also going to be a measure of uncertainty associated with the signals you're, you're dealing with from, from this, the, uh, the stimulus uh, response. Okay, let's zip ahead here past uh, all of this and look at what's really going on when this happens. Okay, now there's a little uh, extra thing that we uh, haven't. Uh, put into this problem yet. What we're writing here is just a response uh, to the stimulus. This is the stimulus, and this would be the response that that stimulus would give me if 
I let it settle. And that's what you have to do, is you start the oscillator off with a stimulus, uh, well, it's going to be driven out there uh, fairly quickly, as we'll see when we do this animation, uh, to approach ex uh, exponentially, this time the exponential is relative to the, resp the ultimate response that you're going to get if you wait and let the, uh, the um, a stimulated uh, part of it take over, be all that's left of the solution. The um, other part of the oscillator is what it gets, what you get just because you had to set the initial conditions of this to zero to start uh, from here. So we've got two uh, parts here. We've got a response function, a greens function, and then we've got the, a particular solution that sets the initial conditions, the, the part of the greens function, total greens function, that sets the initial uh, conditions for the uh, whatever uh, wave your or wave function that you're talking about. So this one is decaying. It's the other name I give to it. So the transient uh, is is going to die by uh, the exponential right here. So it's got a certain time uh, and it's got a certain number of heartbeats to do that. 15 in our case, 15 heartbeats, and this thing will be down to just 5% uh, of what, what, uh, uh, what we started with. And the Green's function has been going all this time, so this will be no longer canceling the Green's function to make our initial condition of zero, you see. So it very quickly uh, uh, grows into the final result, which is a steady state, this, this be, uh, disappearing. Now, um, there are various names for this. There's the homogeneous solution, remember I mentioned that, the, the no force solution, sorry, no stimulus, that's all I've got. And you can set the initial conditions to that thing with this constant right here. It's a complex number, so there are two, two uh, variables in there that let you set any initial condition of position and velocity you want. Anywhere on a phaser, big or small, uh, you can set that. And it will just go from there and oscillate on that phaser uh, circle. This part right here uh, will uh, die. Eventually, you can't beat City Hall. City Hall is a stimulus. And eventually, this will be the total um, thing that's happening. It's known as the inhomogeneous solution in the mathematics, this part right here. Okay, this is known as the particular or homogeneous solution. This one lets you set initial values and boundary conditions. This is not a function of initial values. It only marches to the stimulus uh, function, this guy right here. Okay. And it's known as steady state because that's where you end up after this thing wakes up. Anthropomorphic analogy. You've been going to a party at, uh, at night, now you've got a uh, go to bed and uh, sleep as best you can before the exam is going to be coming up. And you wake up, uh, 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 you know, uh, you know, it's kind of, you're in your transient regime right now. Okay? You've got to get everything all settled down to a steady state. Right? That's the anthropomorphic <laughs> analogy that I give you. You'll probably remember that because this is what the oscillator has to do. It has to wake up and get to the to this thing, the Green's function. Okay? So, what we're saying is that this part of it, right here, where it gets to it, is about 3 over gamma. That's the 15 seconds. 15 heartbeats in this case for our uh, 1 hertz oscillator. Okay? This is about forever. So, this is all a, a quantum electronics guy is going to want to know about. This is what's going to go. This stuff here is just, you know, getting the thing going. Which, okay, can be interesting too. But um, most of the time, since this is forever and that's just a very small time, most high quality oscillators, uh, you're uh, talking about that. So, um, what you will see uh, when you do this is sometimes it behaves like this. This is when you're 
uh, pretty far uh, below uh, resonance. And, and the response that you get is just basically the DC response. This thing has a DC region dominates. And then past the resonance, it goes to zero. This thing, uh, uh, this, this Lorentz function, uh, drops off to nothing. So the, these are, um, I guess the best thing for me to do is just go ahead and maybe play a few of these so you can see it. Uh, let me bring this guy up to speed so we can do the same thing on it if necessary. Uh, we're going to look at some uh, cases here where we have a, a yeah, can very scenario. low thing. That's a pretty lousy uh, picture. Yeah, there. we had canned scenarios, but I yeah, don't see them this, anymore. This, well, this is probably a, a better picture of being in resonance. Uh, that's the middle one. Above resonance is the top one, and below resonance is the bottom one. And you can see there is no, not too much of a, of a difference between above resonance and below resonance. But on resonance, that's the interesting one as far as uh, tuning perfectly to the resonance. That's what's going to happen if the damping is very small. If the damping isn't small, uh, we'll get something here. Now let me see if I can go ahead on this one. This is a picture where you actually can see uh, a little bit of what it is we'll get by animating these things. So I think uh, I'll try uh, on this machine uh, to go ahead and run um, now, um, it looks like these guys uh, don't have scenario settings, so we're going to have to s do that ourselves. Yeah, well, they were. Um, let's about midway through the control panel. Let's uh, go ahead and uh, right click on this thing. We, we have the scenarios under the controls and scenarios. That's true. Uh, why did I do that uh, instead? Um, let's, let's go ahead and, and use them since. Uh, we're getting uh, short on time here. About um, midway down. The uh, there you go. This is uh, that bottom section. This one will, will show us some weak damping. So let's go ahead and do that one uh, 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 first and um, see how that uh, comes out. Okay, that's just without the force. Let's go back uh, to. Uh, controls here and uh, uh, get that uh, again. Let's do um, yeah from that section right here. Driven. Let's do um, well. We'll do this one first. That that gives you uh, some feeling for what happens when I run the thing really slowly. Okay, this is a very low frequency here. Essentially DC. <laughs> okay. Now, you see the thing starts out, it wiggles a little bit, but this is, such a, this is when you're allowed to wake up on Saturday. You can do it from 10 o'clock to 12 o'clock, right? And you don't wiggle much. You just slowly ease into uh, the oscillation that you're going to see. And since it's so small, it's essentially doing it here at about half of its uh, heartbeat uh, lifetime, okay? And the other thing that's important is the phase lag uh, here, which is this, is a thousand, three thousandths of a radian. There's, there's virtually no lag between uh, what this is doing and what that one is doing. This one's only a slight, as you would see if you ran it for a long time, this thing is only a slight bit behind this peak. When this one peaks out, uh, and when they hit zero, they pretty much hit right on there because it's a, th a thousandth of a radian. It's pretty hard to see on this thing. So this is, the, the face space shows it better. See, wiggle, 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 wiggle. Now by now it's getting close to 15, right? And this will just become a circle, you see. So the, there's where you really see the effect of the transients much better than in a plot like that, okay? By the way, uh, this kind of chart is called Smith chart. And we'll talk about that later on. But anyway, we haven't even got one complete uh, oscillation uh, here, and we're, we're coming up on uh, 15 right now. Okay. So that's, that's DC response. Okay. For, it's, you know, all of your uh, electrostatic constants, you know, they're based on this. So when you go to higher frequency, that epsilon starts to be a Lorentz function. 
and you don't just have a constant. Okay, so let's uh, drop back here and uh, take a look at something that's a little farther along. Um, I think I'll go back to um, see if I can do, do that. I should have stayed. I, I should just stay with the animation uh, for uh, now. Let's go uh, and do one that is um, just a little bit uh, further along than a DC, but still below uh, resonance, significantly below it, in the uh, um, sort of the foothills of the Lorenz Mountain. Okay, so this has got you know more of a frequency, and we're seeing. Uh, what is going to be a beat. See the Z is, is about to, trying to catch up with F. And when it, as soon as it catches up and gets ahead of it, that's when it gets killed. We call this a snowplow of anthropomorphization. <laughs> if you're in the east and you want to rush to work and the snowplows are out and you think your car's good enough, you'll try to pass the snowplow. <laughs> right? That can be disastrous <laughs> because now you're faced with you know six, seven inches of snow, right? So that immediately slows you down. You let the snowplow go by. That's what is happening here. So you go through a beat, and then you say, "Oh heck, I'll just stick with a snowplow and go to work behind the snowplow." And that's what we'll get down here. You'll be in the you'll be in the city-state region, but with a, a significant higher amplitude than we had. The amplitude we had before. When you were going at DC, is that big, right? Now we're in the frequency, we're working our way up uh, to uh, getting uh, something that is resonating and has a phase lag, and that's what we're interested in. The steady state phase lag for this one is 0.14 radians. So that's the angle that you're going to see. See, he tried again to pass the snow thought, it didn't work. And so this beat, uh, peak here is going to drop off. Um, a little bit, but by the time we get to 95%, uh, which is right there, we're within 5% of steady state and, 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 and dropping, okay? And we're going to drop into a little spot that's right behind, that is 0.14 radians behind the force, okay? So there's a very small uh, row of steady state. And at this point, it kind of looks pretty level. It's going to get leveler and level, right? The amplitude is not oscillating very much. This is telling you how much of that particular solution is left, right? And by this time, it's only a couple pixels, so you don't see uh, anything but steady state for your Z. Is this making sense? OK. Well, it's, this is all about to change. Uh, as soon as I go, uh, let's just pause this one and go for the next scenario, which is way down at the bottom here somewhere. We just did uh, way below resonance. Do a quick one just a little bit below uh, resonance uh, to get this uh, uh, started here. So. Oh my, this is this one really got kind of a surprise. Now now he's way behind the snowplow. And it's gonna take him a while to catch up because the frequency between these two, the natural frequency and that of the resonance, the omega s and the omega zero, are not that different. Okay, omega zero six point two eight, omega gamma six point two eight also, right? But the actual stimulus uh 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 uh, a frequency uh, omega is uh, 5.65. That's uh, less than 6.28, but only by a, a one or so. So we're getting a great big beat here, and the beat frequency is the difference between those two, which is about one or so uh, 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 hertz. Okay. But eventually, at 15, uh, this is going to level off too. See, this is coming up like that. But now it's just going to go down, and then by the time we get to here, it'll be pretty level, and that'll be our, our steady state. This thing will then be located 
radians behind, uh, that's just a third of a radian or so, behind the snow plow, the force there. Okay, gives you a feeling for it. Well, you want to go for resonance, it's a little, we're right at the end of the class here, so that's probably a good place to uh, uh, stop. Let's uh, go see the controls here again and put her on resonance. Bang. Whoop all. Almost immediately, the thing goes over there and sits at pi over two. And it just sits there and gets longer. Gets longer by the same amount every time. And what is that amount? That's the DC response. So it goes into the pi over 2 and, and then now grows at, at first uh, showing us uh, what the uh, thing. Now, now it's, it's going to be quite a bit bigger than the force on these scales. Remember these are different units that we're plotting here. The blue unit for distance and the F unit for force. But now it's starting to feel the, the friction. Okay? So it's going, instead of continuing as it would if I had a, a very, very low damping, like the atoms that we were talking about, uh, this would go all the way out 50,000 of these uh, before it reached its limit, its steady state limit. So this one is going to reach its steady state limit when the amplitude is well beyond the, the graph here. You can see it's, uh, you can look over here and still see what, what, it's, what it's doing there. It's just picking up a little bit of amplitude every time because the, uh, the, uh, the transient part, the transient solution is, is, is just past our 95% uh, thing right there is a very small, it's just a couple pixels amplitude and eventually uh, it's just going to snuggle up to the steady state, steady state probably about there. You see, each time it picks up a little tiny bit, but it's exponentially smaller uh, each pass. Ding, you see. But it might just about reach my finger if we, you know, stuck around here for another 20 or so oscillations, right? Okay. So that's the anatomy of the first half of a resonance. The second half is just as exciting and I think we'll wait until uh, next time to, to show that one. As I said, this is the most important stuff in physics. Resonance is the single most important phenomenon. Everything that happens in quantum mechanics is resonance of some kind. Everything. That's really frightening. <laughs> or reassuring, depending on how you are with resonance. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot to learn. Okay. We'll... Yeah, I don't think it's going to quite make where my finger was. I didn't see any growth on that last pass. So that's it. That's as far as she's going. <laughs>